Okay, so uh, let us get it going. Good evening, everyone, and uh, really welcome uh, to this very special asset colloquium here today. Uh, special because you would have seen in the various uh, uh, posters and publicity material uh, that it is the 900th asset colloquium in this particular series. So you should allow me to say a few words on this occasion before I formally introduce today's speaker. Uh, in the early days of TIFR, uh, of course, the Wednesday Colloquium, which was started by none other than Homi Baba, uh, and he used to attend every, uh, uh, apparently, every colloquium. And uh, But it was also the forum where uh, the, let us say, the developments in uh, instrumentation and electronics were also presented because that was the only uh, forum where everything that happens in this institute, have, you know, in terms of research was presented. And uh, so uh, Srikantan mentioned somewhere that he, some of the earliest colloquia that he gave were like applications of milli and microsecond pulsers, uh, pulse techniques, uh, which are of course out and out electronics topic, skill and, uh, you know, scale of cosmic ray physics experiments, which he was a, you know, world's well-known cosmic ray physicist and so on. Uh, but later, because of wider uh, scope of various research activities that happened in this institute, and also relatively much faster developments that happened in the, in the basic science domain, uh, the reporting on instrumentation and electronics and allied fields uh, did not receive much attention in his own words. Okay, so the indigenous developments of uh, what he further goes on to say, uh, high technologies in the indigenous developments and high technologies uh, couldn't have been succeed in isolation and uh, therefore will necessarily have to be in the institutions like TIFR uh, that have well established parallel culture of both pure and applied research. And he further says it has been to, you know, it should be emphasized that the existence of high technology efforts in an added advantage uh, in the pursuit of experimental research in basic sciences as it has been the experience of TIFR. So uh, these are some of the words that he actually mentioned about in a, in a foreword in a, in a, in a book uh, that brought some of the earlier uh, colloquia that were given in this series. So having noticed this particular gap that namely the the, the developments of electronics and instrumentation was not reported as frequently as the basic science research topics. Uh, apparently a meeting of all the scientific and technical staff were convened by the then group committee five. Those days they were called group committees, not departments. And uh, Professor B.M. Udgankar was the chair at that time. Somewhere in February, uh, 1983, uh, this meeting was called and then it was decided to start organizing a series of seminars. So that is how the, the previous author of, you can say, ASET, those days it used to be called as Instrumentation and Electronics Colloquia, was started somewhere from March 1983. Uh, so somewhere down the lane, of course, in the journey, the IAE has become ASET. ASET stands for Advances in Science, Engineering and Technology. Some of the founding members and organizers of Asset Colloquium were uh, as Professor S. V. Damle, uh, many of you know, Professor Dinesh Sharma, Prakash Apte, and Professor R. R. Nagarajan. But of course, many, many other colleagues later helped it to grow and also sustain the way it has been happening. And uh, so I want to also share some of my own uh, kind of uh, connections to Asset, if I can say that. Uh, way back early, uh, Jan 2002, I wanted to give myself, wanted to give a colloquia. And then I went around finding who is the organizer was. And of course, these colloquia were not happening regularly. And uh, uh, Professor P.R. Apte, who was actually leaving, uh, left almost uh, to IIT Bombay, uh, you know, he said, well, why not you take uh, can take care, etc. And uh, that time, the Dean Natural Sciences Faculty, Professor Mathur, uh, as a person whom I interacted with, and he said, yeah, okay, maybe you should take, take over. And that's what it happened in uh, January 11th, 2002, is when so-called I gave my colloquium in asset, and since now it is something of the order of 22 years, and today we have the 900th colloquium that's happening. And uh, it's also time a little bit to retrospectively uh, thank some of the uh, people who have really helped grow I'm not talking about the this series of colloquia 
uh, the web page that you see was actually built by one of my colleagues by, by name Pivya uh, Piyush Verma. And uh, Ravindra Shinde has been both my left and right hand in organizing uh, this event. So Khan Sharan designed the uh, the logo that you see. Uh, the mailing list, which was so you know important for reaching out all of you, was developed by Kausalya those days and Indico, of course, as Computer Center. And many of the creatives that you see, posters that you will see even today, they are all designed by many times by Kishore Meenan, who was our former PRO. Asset in the process also, besides organizing uh, colloquia on regular scale, also did uh, some major programs. Uh, some of them, it celebrated 30 years of Asset by organizing uh, colloquia by many of our own colleagues, uh, kind of day-long program. And Asset also organized a special series of colloquia for two full years uh, in, in a part of Omi Baba birth centenary celebrations during 2009 and 10. And as you see the poster right here, uh, this year we are also celebrating, obviously, this 40th year of Asset, and we are celebrating in a big way. And, and these are all part of the celebrations that we are having here. And you also see a special memento that was kind of created for this purpose. Obviously, over a period of these 22 years, uh, Asset has hosted proudly uh, many Nobel laureates, at least one field medalist, and many top scientists, mathematicians, engineers, institute builders, environmentalists, biographers, medical doctors, medical technologists from all across the world, and also our own colleagues, obviously, from all over the country, all field stations, and many, many other colleagues from you know, other government uh, and private institutions. And one great thing about any such long-lasting enterprise is the support. Every department, every section, every individual of the institute, literally starting from the various directors of the institutes, deans, down to every member of the institute, and many others, even from outside the institute, have helped us immensely to grow what, what you see today. And standing very close to the, the best before the kind of date, personally, I can say that it was a fantastic opportunity for me to interact with literally 900. Uh, you know, uh, distinguished speakers of the world and and all that for free because all of you actually proposed these speakers and speakers came and gave the best talks and that is how the asset has run all these years. And so just continuing this journey, today we have uh, Professor Santosh Vadavali, actually is our own um, TFR grown person. Uh, right now, he's in uh, physical research laboratory on the bath. He's going to talk about the real hot topic. Of course, you I don't need to say much about it, roaming on the moon. Uh, so we are very much looking forward to his, uh, his colloquium today. And he's also a person who built things with his hands. That has been the culture of what I kind of mentioned in the introductory remarks as mentioned by Professor B.B. Srikantan. Uh, to give a couple of words about today's uh, speaker, Dr. Santos Vadawale completed his PhD from TIFR in X-ray astronomy. Professor A.R. Rao, I'm sure he's on the screen. He was his thesis advisor and subsequently joined the physical research laboratory after completing a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard. Uh, he's closely involved in the AstroSat CZDI. I'm sure all of you know about one of the payloads of AstroSat. And he played a key role in establishing new hard X-ray Polymetric capability of CZDI is also closely involved in all three Chandrayaan missions uh, with the lead role in Chandrayaan 2 as the PI of XSM um, experiment, I'm sure he's going to talk about. And in Chandrayaan 3, as a PI of the APXS um, experiment, he's also co PI of the uh, Aspects experiment on board Aditya L1 mission, which is, as you know, is a mission to study his son. Currently, is pursuing the development of new generation X-ray instrument, including X-ray telescopes for the future astronomy, solar, as well as planetary science missions of India. So uh, I know it took a little more time than usual, but without taking much more of time ahead, now let me invite Santosh for this. Very much looking forward to our different collection. Thank you. Thank you. So, am I audible? Yeah. So, 
uh it's great pleasure to be standing here and giving this as a colloquium uh i would like to thank uh, dr satyanarayan greatly because he initiated he started he contacted me and he wanted uh, it to happen in very as much as soon as sooner time scale possible actually i uh, fridays were all booked for next 2 3 weeks and then after that it was getting late so that's why he kindly agreed to arrange it on my convenience on this particular day special i hope there was some confusion with some people but i think now everybody is like aware so it was i'm i'm greatly thankful for him to uh, accepting this according to my convenience arrangement uh i am also happy here to say as he mentioned i mean i spent 6 years in tifr starting from 1997 to 2003 uh, after that i have been coming to tifr quite long quite often but while this time i was coming i just realized that it was almost exactly 20 years have passed now so i when i was as a student here i left september 2003 and now i am i just entered here october 2023 so and then uh, time spent in tifr was the most i mean the i would say the best time of my life so far whatever 50 year and that is the root cause of whatever i could do later on and uh, uh, so i will just try to explain some of uh, this part a uh, little quickly okay it's come in na yeah i okay so uh, i will just give little bit of a brief just one or two slides history of how i got involved with this chandrayaan missions what is the role of tifr of course in that and then uh, then i will proceed to uh, apxs and some chandrayaan 2 whatever we experienced and then later on chandrayaan 3 uh, particularly concentrating on the later aspects of uh, rover operations because uh, i think all of you must have seen all the discussions all the videos and everything particularly related to chandrayaan 3 soft landing which is one of the most historic event what we can say in the uh, recent past or ever entire history of the country uh, but after that generally it's it's kind of little uh, less known things how things have happened over next 10 15 days so i will just try to explain some of uh, those aspects and find uh, summarizing uh, i mean since also there are two things for is sec colloquium so i didn't want to go into too much of a science aspect but also there are two uh, other things i mean science is not fully mature because it's just one month after that we are still working on science part so i am not going into any of the uh, scientific details of neither our apxs payload or any other uh, uh, payload but i mean of course if you are interested we can uh, discuss later on but i will uh, right now i will uh, kind of uh, keep it to a more like a popular uh, lecture because again i am not even going into the details of electronics related required or all other aspects required for instrument building and all those things which i suppose many of you are already aware so uh, let me what happened this is the one no no so there was the other one but it's the same one no. the right right same thing yeah right no okay okay it's okay i'll just use it here doesn't matter yeah ah okay yeah so uh, i mean how it all started so that as i said i mean uh, right here in tifr uh, i was working with uh, rao and i was working at that time on uh, this new generation detector what call csat detectors when i joined 1997 the first uh, tifr built instrument was already in space ixe it was giving a good data and uh, that particular success of that instrument had led entire tifr group particularly professor pc agrawal uh, to be much more uh, ambitious and then think of a complete dedicated satellite meant for astronomy which is astrosat probably all of you are aware about that history uh, and so uh, since i was working on this in with the intention that yes this detectors a new instrument based on this detectors was likely to be included as part of astrosat and in fact so i was one of the first person probably i would say in the country where who had actually because tf or rao had just got the system procured from israel and then i was the one who started actually using these and played around with these detectors 
And in that context, uh, there was this important review, national review meeting, which was held here in two, uh, September 2000. And this was like uh, ISRO chairman and all big scientists, everybody had gathered here. And uh, the objective was to kind of uh, give a scientific communities go ahead to two important missions, which have been, which were at that time were been uh, discussed. One was AstroSat and the other one was Chandra. And actually at that time, I had no idea about that Chandrayaan was also included in the agenda. And then uh, it was there basically, uh, of course, we were students. So it was like, not that we could simply walk in, but I, I still remember I had very specifically requested Professor Agrawal so that we can attend it or not. And he kindly agreed. So we did attend this meeting. And then the next discussion was on Chandrayaan and kind of, I was quite surprised by that because I had just read in some magazine somewhere that yes, these kind of possibilities are there and we can go and all. But I was not aware at that time that that is being taken so seriously. So that was my first introduction to Chandrayaan. At that time, it was simple Chandrayaan, not even Chandrayaan 1, because probably you might be knowing that Chandrayaan 1, it became when the proposal formally went to President Abdul Kalam and then he added one and then said, we are going to go with the series and all. So at that time, it was simply known as Chandrayaan. And so, uh, but still, I was never thinking that I will be really working on that. I continued working on this detector. When I went to CFA, again, CFA had this kind of, this very ambitious mission, uh, this Professor George Grindley, he had proposed to NASA, finally didn't uh, come up. But at that time, this was a very big six meter square uh, area detector plane they wanted to build. And then I had a good experience of working on this, so that I continued. It so happened that, again, it was Professor P.C. Agrawal who had suggested at that time to PRL uh, director that uh, you can use the same detector for one of the experiment on Chandrayaan also. And then that is how finally when I visited Chandrayaan in one of my visit to India, I like as usual, we are looking for job and also, and then they said, okay, you start with work, start and work with us. Because uh, that time there were very few people who were actually able to characterize and use that because it's like each and every, uh, there are multiple pixels, 256 pixels working and characterizing them and understanding it's like, at that time, it was complicated. Nowadays, a lot of people are working, but at that time, there were few people. So then that is how I ended up at PRL. And uh, the experiment was, uh, this is called the higher energy excess spectrometer. Uh, so all this was completely new for me. I had no idea because I was purely from astronomy background, but then I started working and reading a little more on moon and what is the kind of, uh, what you mean by this volatile transport phenomenon? What is the basic problem? Why it is meant? So uh, at that time, you remember this is like we are talking 2005 and six, and at that time it was completely. And I mean, it was absolutely clear that moon is a bone dry. There is no water on it. This was all the information which came uh, earlier Apollo times, and then later on some few moon mission. Uh, it was Chandrayaan one's other instrument which actually have changed this understanding, and then now it is like everybody knows there is a moon water on moon in all possible forms. Uh, including ice and uh, H2O plus uh, hydroxyl ions, etc. But so at that time, there were some doubt that moon hosts some permanently shadowed region in the polar uh, uh, polar region, permanently shadowed crater in polar regions where sunlight will never reach because they are always in shadow. They are always ultra cold temperatures. And then somehow if some water molecule gets in that because of some random motion, they will be permanently trapped there. And then as a result, this permanently shadowed crater could be could harbor a large amount of water. This was a simple hypothesis. And how do we, how that can be uh, tested? So then that is why this Professor Bandari from TRL, he came up with the idea that if we can use some other tracer, so he, uh, he used the um, uh, radon uh, gas, it has a X-ray line in at, at 40, 50 keV. And then, so since radon is also volatile, if we use a hard X-ray mapping of the uh, lunar polar region, and if we can see some enhancement in the uh, craters, that at least that proves the volatile transport phenomenon, which means that there is a possibility of uh, that occurring for water also. So that was the basic objective. Uh, of course, in terms of uh, real result, it, it, it did not work because there were some other issues with the mission. It could not be operated for as long as time we wanted, but it did give a first hard X-ray spectrum, continuum spectrum of measurement of the moon. This was of course later on published and all. Uh, again, so my intention of the, using this was to basically use whatever knowledge gathered uh, for AstroSat because I was also interested, my primary interest at that time and even still is in extra astronomy, particularly studies of black hole binaries and all. So these actually characterization has very significantly provided inputs for CZTI, 
एंड आई कैन से एक्चुअली की बिकॉज ऑफ वॉट एवर वी लर्न ड्यूरिंग दिस टाइम हेक्स टाइम फॉर अबाउट डिरेक्टर हैव रिजल्टेड इन सीजे टी आई बींग probably one of the best calibrated spectroscopically calibrated instrument on astrosat uh, we can say so this this had a very good uh, uh, input for that uh, so now once chandrayaan 2 was i mean chandrayaan 1 was any anyway, we would all know it was launched in 2008 but even before that around 2006 7 itself people had started talking about what after chandrayaan 1 because as we know i mean since the one was added later people start were getting more ambitious and saying that once chandrayaan one happens what are we going to do now the brainstorming mission was uh, meeting was there in prl and uh, uh, there again sort of i had presented a slightly different experiment again it was in the context of some upcoming x ray experiment which is polix hopefully now if some of you are aware it is going to get launched in uh, another 3 uh, to 4 months probably and on that there were some soft x ray spectroscopy potential was there and i was planning to uh, i mean i was thinking that if that also similar instrument can be developed on the pretext of using it on both mission it would be useful so in that way i had uh, uh, projected this uh, chandrayaan 2 mission as such so this was only on conceptual idea but formally at the government level it was conceived with a collaboration with russia at that point of time so uh, the lander was supposed to come from russia and the launch was from uh, isro and there was this rover initially was Russia was supposed to play, but then later on it it was kind of either joint and then ISRO uh, rover and all. So all this was finalized around uh, 2009, and then the formal call for proposal for all scientific instruments on Chandrayaan 2 was there in 2009. Uh, there were number of proposals, four or five from PRL, five from PRL, but all four of them were meant for one particular focus, including my own. That is to measure the elemental abundances or chemical composition of the surface. so uh, this is again i will just spend one minute here to explain because in for any planetary science particularly uh, airless bodies like moon the elemental composition of a surface plays a very important role in understanding its evolution and uh, origin evolutionary history and there are different models which requires so uh, these cannot be done by uh, what you call normal remote sensing the optical or ir ultraviolet spectroscopy because those signatures are all of a mineral as such and uh, whereas we, uh, in many cases single mineral is composed of multiple elements which are substituting each other and so uh, that is also important information but at the same time independently knowing the ratios of different elements is also important so that can be done only uh, using either x rays or gamma rays because they are the one which are directly coming from the individual atoms so uh, this information is so important that all over world if you see the different histories of uh, this kind of instrument there are multiple techniques have been applied starting from x ray fluorescence which comes directly from the inner atomic transitions or gamma ray spectroscopy which is just a nuclear transitions or even people are trying with uh, oje electron uh, instead of inner uh, inertial transitions instead of x rays the electrons are getting uh, emitted with a specific energies so all all this kind of uh, experiment techniques are done and the outcome of all of them is just a measurement of abundance interpretation of these abundances is completely so decoupled by this measurement problem because then that goes into the completely uh, different geological domain where how do you use it so these two are kind of separate issues and more many people from experimental side they are concerned till uh, giving the measure elemental abundance measurement so i also myself thought that okay well that is something which i can do geology is not my cup of tea because that requires completely different set of training from probably college onwards so uh, in that way uh, these two proposal these proposals were uh, submitted for elemental abundance measurements and uh, finally the selection happened in 2009 10 with a probable launch in uh, 2012 13 that that time these were the dates of course there are some delays are associated with all space programs in this case there was a major problem because maybe some of you might be remembering the uh, russian phobos grant mission failed which was to mission to mars and then it, the reason traced down to some basic uh, problem with the bus design and all so finally uh, it it was conveyed that yes they will not be able to meet any of the timelines and then as a result finally it was isro decided to go with a completely indian mission where the lander is also supposed to be developed by isro and then at that time the Device time slide for Chandrayaan two was 2017 uh, launch, which finally happened in 
so these two payloads were there so basically we were we started working on these two payloads from prl for almost 2010 onwards and so i will just quickly give this uh, idea because this i'm just jumping a little bit because we have not reached to chandra and two as such i will talk about it uh, the landing part of it little later i will just give you this instrument uh, because this is right now working on orbiter uh, this was one of uh, the payload which was selected uh, for orbiter where it uses the idea is to have a very small uh, x-ray detector which will uh, measure the x-rays from sun uh, for the purpose of uh, uh, giving a, a sort of quantitative interpretation of another uh, instrument which is there uh, on chandrayaan 2 orbiter which is measuring x-rays from moon and uh, so along with that it can also do a lot of independent solar physics it is it has a very good uh, characteristics it has the uh, new special detectors and it has a lot of good uh, properties like it detects the yeah, of automatic intelligence uh, on board and then there are repeatable calibration on board so it in it, it it's working as one of the best possible x-ray detector and it is giving a fantastic uh, solar physics data a uh, large number of people are interested in this data there are a lot of people there are already many publications uh, most importantly data is made public available as soon as uh, it is available the, the we are maintaining this website and prl if you are interested you can just check out and it gives all the details of how to work with that particular data and uh, it is i can definitely say that it is currently the best x-ray spectrometer in the world which is uh, working i mean which is operating regularly there are some efforts like for example short duration some small cube sets or some rocket flights where there could be a slightly better resolution or a better uh, uh, longer energy range detector might be flying but something which is going on for 3 years 4 years continuously working and likely to continue for another 3 4 years this is the best and as a result lot of international groups are also showing uh, interest and we have all we are already doing lot of collaborative uh, science on various missions is solar dynamics observatory by nasa solar orbiter from isa uh, hinode it's a joint uh, jaxa nasa mission so uh, this is something working very fine very good and then it's like a uh, great satisfaction because i think if some of you might remember i had given uh, one talk here 4 year ago at that time again i had presented both xsm and the other instrument apxs in anticipation that they will be working good and so it is very good to see that after four years that has actually lived up to the uh, expectations so then now i will just come to the other instrument our which is main apxs chandrayaan 3 and of course chandrayaan 2 i will put because at that time also this was on rover uh what the objective here is again to measure this uh, element in situ elemental elemental and uh, abundance measurement of a lunar surface so what it's like same chemical analysis so uh, here the idea was that the instrument will be sitting on rover and as a rover goes around different places on moon uh, you will get elemental composition at different places uh, it uses uh, same x ray fluorescence and also what you call pixi that is particle induced x ray emission so of uh, and uh, for that it it uses this radioactive sources alpha source typically radioactive alpha sources have around 4 5 mev alpha uh, energy and few 10 kv x rays which can both uh, give pixi and uh, xrf processes on moon and as a result you can get all this uh, different elements and these are the elements which are the major called major element they compo- they form up almost 99 99.5% of the total bulk uh, moon lunar rocks and uh, so then it, it uses this uh, alpha sources we used this curium 244 x uh, radioactive source and then uh, i will come to this little later because this was some of the important changes which i did it so i would just like to make uh, here one uh, clarification that apxs where it was originally proposed it was proposed by our other colleagues in prl and so the principal investigator of this instrument was uh, there's one professor sws murthy from prl uh, i was involved in that because it it used the same detector what we were using for uh, this uh, xsm so all the electronics and everything was identical for it so the all the x ray part of it was uh, my kind of contribution for ap xs so i was involved in the beginning but uh, i took up uh, as a pi of this in 2015 after he superannuated and then i'll just show some changes which happened after that so uh, just to say i mean i'm without going into too much of uh, technical details what are the main challenges of uh, realizing it so one is of course the basic analog electronics right now all this is in in the domain of analog electronics which will work at a uh, uh, which give, gives the sufficient low no- noise characteristics and as a result you get a high resolution 
and all this has to be done in a, as small and as compact size as possible because like in general space mission space experiments are on a very tight budget of mass power size but here it was also on landing and rover so this was like ultra premium uh, and we had like even at some point of time if you are exceeding 700 gram allocated if 10 15 grams also were resulting in like huge debates of why you are exceeding mass and all so that kind of uh, uh, constraints were there but so finally it is good to see that it was actually done exactly in the same all the specifications you could meet and including all uh, required uh, design changes so the other main pro point was that in order to see the detect the x-rays from moon it needs to go very close to the surface uh, almost five centimeter and this had led to a lot of complication in the design part i will just go uh, later on and of course handling this uh, uranium 244 sources uh, we are having 30 millicurie. So, if anybody working with the radioactive sources will kind of understand that uh, laboratory calibration sources are typically of the order of micro sources. Even if it goes to 1 millicurie, we consider it to be strong. This is uh, quite strong. So, there are a lot of other uh, safety aspects to be considered when we are using this kind of sources. So, how that we need to take. And of course, like how actually we characterize it because that that's a completely different domain. I will just show a couple of slides for these three. So now, as I mentioned, I mean, how it, it, it changed. So initially, when it was conceived, it was meant on a slightly more ambitious way, where there was a kind of a little bit of a small arm was given. We call it robotic arm. And at the end of it, the instrument was there. So the idea was that even if you go close to some rock or something, it should be able to go and touch or close to rock and then make the measurement. Because that is how uh, the NASA rovers, they are doing it. They actually have uh, much more complex arms with a multiple uh, uh, degrees of freedom. Here we had only one degree of freedom, but then uh, during the course of review, there were some changes because of mass constraints and also because of the justification, why do you really need the, to go five closer or five centimeter close and all there were questions. So this was dropped and then this kind of fixed mount uh, configuration was arrived at around 2005. Uh, while I was there, but at that time, kind of there were some other discussions, but when I took up this uh, as a PI, the first thing I tried to do within ISRO, because again, these things are very difficult. Once something is decided to change it, it becomes difficult. But somehow I could actually engineer it to see that this question comes back again from various review committee. And then to satisfy them, we uh, propose some other solutions which will satisfy the distance criteria without adding any extra weight penalty. So finally, uh, this kind of uh, design was arrived where uh, the instrument itself just simply hinges on a one point and it lowers down. So uh, without having additional uh, weight of the robotic arm, you can still go to close to the surface and uh, do the measurement. So finally, this is one how it was flown. Uh, of course, there is this one uh, we have also in terms of because all X-ray detectors calibration is a very critical aspect. This was not there earlier. So we I sort of added and then in the in the context of uh, in the course of measurement, you always do this calibration plate first because when you are moving on moon surface at that time it was not clear whether what kind of dust environment is there alpha sources are extremely sensitive to dust so even a very thin layer of dust will also change the alpha properties so we need to know what if there is if there is any change or not between two measurements so that is why all the measurements were planned like this uh sources of course this was a completely different story i think i will not go too much into detail but uh, getting these alpha sources because these are not the one i mean these, these sources are not available directly in open market actually again even now when that time it was available only from uh, russia and uh, we had a long story in getting them uh, in fact in between around 15 it was uh, it, it was sort of kind of uh, thought that they are not going to come from russia and we in fact started uh, with brc other alternate effort of using abrasion 241 not the best suitable because it requires much larger source area and additional weight, etc. But then finally, in 2015, actually at a very high level, in fact, to the prime minister level, when the discussion happened with Russian president, and then as a result, we could actually get this uh, sources. And then finally, all other regulatory compliance, which are associated with the permission from ARB licenses, transport, all the container design, all those things we could do like at every stage. I mean, now in the hindsight, when I see it, it, it looks very nice that we could do it. But when the process of getting it through was like really challenging, but it was, I mean, finally, we could uh, do that. And then, of course, as I said, calibration, because uh, here 
this part, I mean, it's not a simple Excel detected calibration because right now what we are talking is how the Pixie and XRF process responds to, uh, I mean, the, the different target materials. And then because of alpha, it has to be done in a vacuum, but at the same time, it's a distance sensitive. So it has to be all at a different possible distances. And normal vacuum chambers cannot be used because all the samples are in the form of dust. So if you simply evacuate, the dust will flow. So it, it requires some very specialized setup to calibrate, which we actually build it in TI, uh, PRL. And then just to show this is the kind of uh, X-ray spectrum it looks where you can see. Uh, this is a terrestrial sample, one of the basalt sample which we have measured. And then you can see all kind of different elements you can identify. And then when you measure the intensity, uh, it's a proportional to its abundances. But again, there are a lot of issues here. It's not direct proportional because there are uh, presence of one element affects the line strength of the other elements and all. So all these complications are involved. But finally, after that, we could do this kind of uh, characterization and and, and uh, we actually have very good confidence in terms of what we can, how much accurately we can measure. And we have also showed that we're using some of this, uh, what you call geochemical reference material from USGS, this United States Geological Survey, which provides the samples with a certified composition. So we have used a large number of those samples, also some unknown samples, but known material, uh, known composition. And then sort of, we have done a lot of uh, uh, iterations with different cases. This also has to be done for different sources differently because it's a very sensitive to even a slightest variation between different sources. So we did these almost three times the entire exercise because before Chandrayaan 2, when we launched that source, all the calibration was done. But then if you know Chandrayaan, that source was, that calibration was not useful. Chandrayaan three times, again, we did the entire repeated exercise, but then we found that the source holder and there was some degradation, which is not space worthy. So then again, we made a new source for this again, we did. So although this is kind of uh, highly time consuming, but uh, interesting exercise which you could do. And finally, as we all know, I mean, Chandrayaan 2 2019 launch, absolutely perfect launch, perfect journey, everything. But at the end, this was for landing. So I mean, I was there and it's like absolutely heartbreaking for everybody. But for some of us who had done, I mean, it was really challenging time to see. For us, actually, it was a little more challenging because I was after the mission people on the next day to start our XSM observation. Because if you see sometimes somewhere I have actually shown that the, 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 the this lander crash happened on 6th September. Despite forgetting everything, we could actually power on XSM on next day morning, 7th September. So that is also so there was some interesting time. And then as a result, we are actually getting very good data from XSM. But the question remains that, I mean, what happened and how? So uh, this is, I'm just trying to, probably so many of you might have been aware about this by now because this has been discussed uh, at a multiple forum by different ISO people. But just to recap, I mean, if some of you would be interested. Uh, so what happened was basically there are these three, four reasons, all of them coming together in one way. So it's a kind of addition of all uh, minus. So this is statistically speaking a rare occurrence. But it, it happens, and that is why it happened that uh, there was this overperformance of engine, particularly engines when they wanted to reduce the power thrust. It reduced, but not up to the level it wanted. The additional thrust was some 7%. Some thrust was there during one of the critical phase, which is called camera costing phase. And as a result, it, it, it reduced the velocity much more than what it could be accepted for the next phase. Uh, that, along with some small error, along with some stringent limit, on attitude correction, for example, it wanted to rotate the, to correct this aspect, the onboard guidance uh, algorithm wanted to rotate the satellite by 16 degrees per second, but there was a limit because you don't want to rotate it arbitrarily. So that's why you always put some limit. That limit was put on 10 degrees. So as a result, it could not achieve that particular state faster. So a combination of all of them resulted in crash landing. If a, any one of them would not have been there, actually it would have been also successful landing at that time. So that was the situation. Anyway, after that, of course, all the lessons learned, uh, the lander was completely reconfigured, keeping all changes in lander, but only ascension changes, because this was also a very conscious decision that we don't want to make any new unnecessary change there. Whatever was known to not work properly was only to be changed. A uh, lot of change, uh, like, of course, the increase in mass is a result of other later changes, but like all these uh, sensor improvements, all the propulsion system improvements, software guidance control, 
uh, in and the one good thing was by that time uh, we had this uh, orbiter working so the uh, ohrc which is high resolution camera was already working in orbit so at this time a much larger area could be afforded for landing because at the, the actual image of that area with a very high resolution of 30 cm was available from ohrc so this was uh, one advantage rover of course there was no design change because rover was not tested at all in earlier case so again this was a kind of conscious decision that we don't want to make any changes in fact some things we wanted to change in the new rover design particularly in original design there uh, there is no visual observation of wherever we are measuring the pxs is measuring uh, uh, x ray in that area so we were requesting whether a small tiny camera can be kept uh, in earlier when we designed in 2000 11 12 such cameras were not available but in 1918 it was available 18 19 so we thought that whether you can add it but that was kind of again not favored because that would add many other changes in the rover electronics and all so there was no change so finally in terms of actual detection uh, objectives what was specified officially this is by sort of isro first and foremost you just want to demonstrate soft and safe landing uh Chandrayaan 2, it was like a pinpoint in a sense that we have decided one particular location and there only it can land. Here, that was kind of relaxed. The first thing is to soft land. If it requires, it can go anywhere else to find a new spot to land. Once it lands, you demonstrate rover on lunar surface. And then, of course, then you carry out some scientific experiments. So what scientific experiments? Again, all these things, probably you might be aware. There are some six uh, payloads. Three of them are on uh, lander. Uh, so this is a seismic measurement. Uh, there is another one is a Langmuir probe which measures a local plasma characteristics, and the, the, the other one is a thermophysical experiment, Chaste. Uh, all ISRO centers is Leos, uh, Ramba, LP, which is done in SPL. This is again joint PRL plus SPL, so PRL has also good contribution here. Uh, and rover, we have this uh, LIBS, laser induced background spectroscopy, which is again eventual uh, objective is to uh, measure the elemental composition, but with a different technique. This is a laser breakdown spectroscopy, and of course, APXS from PRL. And proportional module, this is one experimental payload. Probably, uh, again, this has a lot of things have been talked about in the media. Uh, it, it looks at Earth from moon surface. And then because this word habitable planet has been used, there is some misconception. Actually, what it does is it, it, it looks at Earth as a kind of point object, measure a specially integrated uh, IR spectroscope, spectropolarimetric uh, signatures with an idea that eventually, suppose if ever end up measuring some exoplanets, IR spectropolarimetric uh, signatures, at that time, we should have some library to compare those with uh, us. So uh, that in that context, this was included, and then it did uh, perform good, and it, there are some results. I am not going to show any of the science result of that because, of course, all the teams are working, still working on it. I mean, they have not yet officially uh, reported any uh, results or interpretation of that. So I, I will just uh, lay equip that. Uh, just to mention, I mean, there are these are the, some of the very important parts which. Uh, which were useful for landing, like all these are the cameras and various sensors for altimeters and uh, uh, velocity me me measurements and all. But they are kind of not considered, these are all same, similar to camera, but they are considered as a ISRO's internal uh, plan. So there are not too many details available in public domain. I mean, well, of course, I have some more, but then again, I'm not showing them because I want to keep it only with whatever is kind of available. Right? So, and then uh, Rover, of course, has uh, two more points. One is the navigation camera, which is what actually looks at the picture. And then based on that, the next path is uh, determined. And then inclinometer, uh, how the local terrain is changing. Because, and these two, I mean, based on these two only uh, further uh, things are done. So I'll just show some of the images on some of the plans, how it worked out based on this. So, okay, the one more point was like actual testing. So there are extreme, extensive testing done. Uh, similar testing was done with Chandrayaan two times also, but still there were slightly different way. For example, uh, in the cold test, which we call cold test means the propulsion system is not involved. Only the actual cameras and altimeters and other sensors are involved. Uh, and these were mounted in a helicopter. So in Chandrayaan two time, what was done was in a 
uh, aeroplane. But then aeroplane, there were some issues in a way he like it can uh, taste only a certain limited range of velocities and certain limited range of height. Particularly hovering aspect was not possible. So that's why this time everything was repeated with a, a helicopter test with a large number of uh, tests carried out over multiple months. And then finally, hot test means including actually the propulsion system in loop, where the if uh, the cameras will see some hazardous terrain which is purposefully built below, and then how the propulsion system respond to it and whether it can go to different uh, uh, directions and all. So this kind of test, large number of tests were done. Uh, similarly, like strengthening of the legs because even if it, it falls, let's say with a slightly higher than intended velocity, it should still survive the structure. Structure should still survive. So these are the kind of tests done. Uh, more interestingly, the rover part, because I mean, this is these are some of the tests where actually I was personally, you know, because all these aspects, as you know, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm primarily only from payload side. So this is all general, whatever general people are aware, maybe a little more than that, I get information. So this is all, I'm not directly involved in any of them, but some of the rover tests and rover aspects, which were actually, I was directly involved in them, where uh, this was uh, done again, because you have to do with the uh, lunar gravity environment, you have to use this uh, uh, balloon to offset some of the Earth's gravity. So these actually, these balloons are from our Hyderabad uh, balloon facility. I mean, so th this was a good important contribution for all this testing. And then uh, spatial test beds were done where it you can mimic uh, lunar regolith, uh, the, all the fine dust uh, particle sizes and all the different craters and all those things. And also completely open outside terrain. So rover was also tested in a complete uh, out, outdoor uh, testing. So a lot of uh, so there was a lot of confidence actually in functionality of rover at least. And this was done even in Chandrayaan two time also. So at that time also it, there was a very good confidence. And then finally, of course, again we are launch. We had missed this opportunity in Chandrayaan two, but this time we made sure that we will actually go and take a lander photograph because for all the teams involved, this is a very important part. But we couldn't so we it was good that we could manage this time and then finally again we had a good launch and uh, as you know I mean this is the trajectory where you design uh, with the multiple earth loops to get again advantage of the earth's gravity uh, get captured in moon uh, separation in orbit and then finally you start uh, landing I will just show this one animation which shows I mean uh, it, it looks all very easy and it like uh, by now ISRO has sort of demonstrated it for some four or five missions and so everybody assumes that yes it is going to happen but it is not that trivial because if you remember when earlier when you launched the moon was somewhere here it should come all the way here and then precise that point it should meet and then exactly at that instance and if there is a smart even a one second difference in your firing time or uh, your error in the estimation of your uh, craft position x y z and velocity uh, which is at a four lakh kilometer distance from Earth, so that both this knowledge and the propulsion system accuracy is very critical, and it is like large number of missions have actually missed this kind of insertion. So far, if you see the history, there are some actually ten or twelve missions which have been missed just because it, they couldn't get inserted properly at, at that time. So uh, now ISRO has, of course, developed a good confidence and they are doing it. So I just wanted to emphasize that, that this is actually really a, a, a tricky uh, point. So. Then, of course, the big moment where I think all of you must have also seen live. This was one of the most live watched uh, event uh, in the history of uh, YouTube, at least. And 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 I mean, I, I I have personally experienced that. Like whenever we were going, also okay, when we were going at that time, actually we had some T-shirts with Chandrayaan three and also a lot of people were knowing. So everybody who is looking at it, I mean, say either congratulating or before landing, they are just giving best wishes. And every time, so the whole country, if you see, was just so much attached with this particular event and uh, after that a lot of people have told me that all of them have started crying in fact at our home and everybody was so this was like really emotional uh, uh, moment for everybody at that time and uh, so just to say i mean i don't know many some of you might have seen this movie but i can still not resist to show this where it actually sees the how the lunar terrain is and how, uh, how so how rough the entire situation is and how difficult it would be to actually uh, non human instrument uh, software control to uh, find out where actually you will go and land how and how you will land so uh, this is of course uh, it is taken by one of the lander imager as it goes uh, so this was a new addition in chandrayaan 3 time that this live imagery was available in chandrayaan 2 this was not available actually it was coming at a much lower rate so there was no possibility of making this kind of movie but 
uh, Chandrayaan-3. So you can see now uh, in the last two times, if you see that there were some hovering stages where actually the lander hovered at around 800 meter height for about 50 seconds to see whether it is safe or not. Then again, it comes down to 150 meter and then hovers. And finally, of course, it could land. Okay, I am actually not doing very well in time, so I will go a little fast. And so finally, of course, you know, I mean, uh, yes, we know it's landed, but yeah, finally we are actually seeing. So this is the image. Uh, the day was decided such that immediately uh, two hours after the landing, the Chandrayaan-2 was passing over the landing site. And then this was the first image which was given by the orbiter high resolution camera. Uh, so this came much later. So I'm just showing it a little earlier because some of the next events will, will come a little later. And then not only we, of course, everybody else is also seeing. So this is the by uh, LRO, which is an NASA mission. Uh, they have observed this and they are showing, uh, you can see this one tiny dot. And not only NASA, there is this Korean KPLO, this is a Korean uh, Pathfinder Lunar Observatory, which is already there on uh, lunar orbit. Uh, they also observed it and they have seen this. And just one more slide I will show to show, I mean, this is what we call advantage OHRC, that when we say OHRC, our orbiter high resolution camera on Chandrayaan 2, which is the best imaging camera right now on the lunar orbiter, which you can see here, uh, is approximately the same size of the area. This is observed by NASA. Okay, I forgot to put a label here, but this is by uh, LRO and this is OHRC, where you can see the same craters and uh, some of the smaller ones you will not be able to actually identify in this case. So uh, this, this shows the kind of power of OHRC and that's why a uh, lot of people, including NASA himself, NASA uh, itself is like very keen to get these OHRC images for the next upcoming Artemis missions also. And then and that is already uh, the discussions are going on about how it can be imaged and how it can be uh, supplied and all. So, so this is like really uh, good development which have happened because of Chandrayaan 2. So then of course, I will just quickly uh, run through. Uh, this was the first image probably all of you would have seen uh, after landing within a few uh, hours, I would say, because first couple of hours were all kind of celebrations. Everybody's congratulating everybody, but then within a couple of hours, people started working together again and then so I have again, uh, probably this is also uh, a movie for a deployment of a RAM. And then this was again another moment where like, uh, when this is the first time you are seeing that, yes, the RAM is deployed and this is the rover sitting on top of a RAM. And uh, then uh, next part, you will see like uh, it is slowly, oh no, this is, I think I have, Mixed up some sequence. Ah, okay, there was some movie here, which again, I think it is, I, uh, I don't know. But so basically what I wanted to show was that uh, once it came, once it came down from RAM, uh, the first thing you see, so this is where all the kind of problem, I would not say problem, but the challenges started that uh, when, when we saw this particular picture at the time itself, it was know that this is the one crater which might actually pose a problem. And then uh, when it happened uh, right here, you see the situation was such that he, as soon as the, the RAM deploys and the rover comes out, the first thing it would encounter is this particular crater. And then there was no real way of avoiding it because the even crater rotation, I mean, rover rotation also would require some distance from crater because otherwise it would collide with the uh, ram. So these particular had uh, caused a lot of impact. More than one day went in all this discussion about how to handle that. And then that is why you can see here, for example, you see this crater shadow. If you see sun was just a very low elevation first day, this finally could uh, go after maybe I think more one and a half day. After exploiting all other options, finally we decided nothing doing. We have to go through it. That is the only option. And then it actually it went through it. So uh, there was again a lot of excitement at that point of time. How will it happen? And this was supposed to be actually captured on movie. I had this, but uh, it so happened that at that time there were some issues in the commanding because of the Earth's atmosphere. And so actual crater crossing part was not captured, but the later part was actually captured. So here the, uh, the rover is actually moving. And then finally, after crossing this, it will go and then it will rotate because this rotation is required. I will just show because it has to be always such that the solar panels are oriented perpendicular to the sun. And then so this was the first time. So after at this position, it came. Uh, we hope to start now our regular operations. So regular operation means uh, the first 
APX's observation. Because all along all what we have been waiting is that how and when you will actually start. So now once the rover was uh, stationed at that particular position, uh, we thought that we will start now. Uh, so this was again, by the time it was like two days later, 25th August, uh, everything went smooth initially for five, 10 minutes, but then suddenly it powered off. So this was another drama. I mean, we were not expecting at all how it, how it can happen. But then finally, of course, after all this uh, detailed this, uh, scrutiny, how, what command was given and what happened and why it happened, etc. I find out that some later on, at a much later stage, somebody had actually inserted some additional safety conditions there where uh, it, it, if it encounters some hitting any material and anything which is hitting, anywhere, then it will switch off all the payloads. And then that hitting was actually the real switch, which we had the limit switch, which we had part, uh, planned as a part of IPXS. So then as a result, it, it got off. But anyway, so this, it took only a couple of hours to figure it out. And then it was rectified. And then finally, we could actually get the first operation uh, in which the actually payload comes down like this and get deployed and then again gets stored back. And these are the one, okay, so this was not during the first observation. This Actual images are later stage. I'm just showing it here. But uh, we could actually see whatever we had seen in the lab, uh, clean room. With the same thing was actually seeing it on moon. It was like really exciting to see that. So then now, once we had this one observation, we all hoping that well everything will go smooth. We will plan go ahead as much as we had planned. Uh, so the plan was something like this. Uh, again, this has been all arrived over a multi-year discussion before Chandrayaan-3 launch, before Chandrayaan-2 launch, uh, it was like the two parallel activities going on where it will take about five hours to get the data down and then to plan out all the uh, measurements, the 3D terrain map to decide what is the actual uh, next stop to give back the command. But in the meantime, the other chain though is such that all the payload operations will be take a, uh, will be continuing on the rover and that, that data will be transmitted to the lander and through lander it will come to Earth. All these things was done. Uh, maximum possible distance was based on this consideration that the two navigation camera, which gives a stereoscopic view of the moon, uh, the overlapping region was from three to five meters. So typically between three to five meter and plus minus 30 degree was the terrain in which you get actually three, three dimensional, what you call DEM, the digital elevation model, uh, without which we will not be able to proceed further. So then a maximum distance at a time was five meter. And then as a result, in over 11, 12 days operation, you can get about 270 meter was the kind of expectation. And then the way it should go is like in, in this one arc, because when it lands, the sun will be somewhere here. Uh, it is coming to go, the sun is moving to north. So over the uh, one lunar day, day 12, 13, on 13th day, it was supposed to be uh, switched off. Uh, sun would have moved this stress. And as a result, because you want to keep this red one, less solar panel always per perpendicular to sun, uh, the rover should pass like this, there were some flexibility of choosing path in that 30 degree cone angle. So it could be maybe slightly sharper arc or a shallower arc or wherever you want. So this is what we wanted to see. And so eventually, again, so we had a lot of discussion with the rover team. Safety of the rover was the most important. Of course, it's most important. But then when we want to say, okay, okay we want to go close to crater, the moment we say that they were all jumping up and down saying, oh, how can you think about going there? I mean, we want to go far or we want to keep safe. So there's a lot of discussion. And then finally, it was kind of agreed that at least for the first five, four, five days, science people will not come into the any path planning issues. We will first go out and we, as much as possible, we go to safe distance. Then we will see whether some challenging observations can be taken up or not. So he said, okay, fine. I mean, it, it makes sense. And uh, so that is how it was all planned. Uh, there were all these uh, various things like uh, what kind of boulders it can take up, what kind of slope it can take up, communication or shadow. And also at any given point of time, communication means for next 24 hours, both the power should be available, RF link should be available because in case it, it cannot move. So at that time, we were thinking that 24 hours is a too much optimistic because we will never be in the same position for 22 hours, 24 hours. But finally, it ended up happening. Actually, it was there for more than one day. It was there. So this kind of conservative approach was still very important. And, uh, but of course, I mean, nothing works like what you do. First step itself, first mobility. So they used, technically they used to call the one point to other point as the one mobility. First mobility from that, uh, this position where the rover was in this uh, shadow, uh, in, in, in this uh, field of view of the lander camera. The lander, lander camera field of view is limited to this particular site. And 
one it went here five meter and it encountered this big crater, which was actually completely unanticipated. And why I will show a little later. And then again, there is no way to go further. So then the only possibility was to come back again to the same position. Uh, of course, again, then you try little more angle and you see again this big, uh, all these things are being blocked. And now, again, so finally we came back to the same position. These are all kind of contingency measures, not, not, not thought of a priori. So every step requires like almost infinite series of arguments and infinite series of meetings and everywhere you have to keep on saying and one by one group will say okay we can do this the other group will come up say no 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 that is not possible and the third group will say something is not possible so it was like really interesting and all this is going on 24 by 7 literally 24 by 7 i mean and in fact the most of the time the useful things were happening only in the middle of night so it was like really uh, uh, good time to be there from i would say 23rd to almost 3rd september we were literally there in the control center 24 hour and uh, so after doing this, then again, it came back. And that is where I think I have this one more. I think this movie probably, probably people would have seen that uh, it, it, it made this number of different rotations there only to look for. The, uh, uh, this is shown continuously, but at a different, different rotations. It was kind of just looking at the images at different size and see key where it can go further. So uh, and, and this and then finally, so after spending good two, three days on this, it was decided that, well, there is no possibility of following whatever this R, which was decided earlier. I mean, there is no way it can go towards the east side. And then the only op uh, real option turned out to be was to actually go on west side, which was completely opposite to what was planned. And that, but rover now, panel has to be perpendicular to the sun. There is no other option. So rover has to move back. But the navigation camera only mounted at the front side of it. So then at every stage, it has to rotate full back, take a pictures. Then you get that, then again rotate back and then uh, pass, uh, proceed for another mobility. So that is how, so it, it appeared quite complicated, but compared to all other options, this was the safest option that was arrived. And then uh, finally, uh, it was decided. And then you see, this is the one which has been released by ISRO. Uh, so it, it went first toward this. Then again, it went here and then it came back. So then there was, so you can see this part actually was seen in OHRC. So this was the issue like earlier when the first two days, then there was no science team involved in that. So that's why they did not actually consult the OHRC map for this planning that mobility. And as a result, they could not actually see. The other two craters are not very clearly seen in even OHRC. So that, is a, that is also a challenge because the even though OHRC looks at it at a 30 centimeter resolution, practically useful two pixels, 60 centimeter. The navigation camera, what we are seeing is almost of the centimeter scale. So the difference between that two, again, it, it becomes very difficult to see key, uh, to correlate the two features. So then finally, it, it went all the way. Of course, not in the straight line. This is drawn by, uh, drawn by hand by some of our colleagues. I mean, our couple of PRL colleagues were there sitting in the control center and they were kind of uh, directing different things. So this is drawn by hand, not really to the scale. But again, I mean, what is the real position is also very difficult to ascertain because the only thing we know is to we have given a command to rotate wheel by a certain degree whether it has really rotated or whether it has slipped or whether in which direction it has gone there is no way to know so there is no absolute positioning there i mean we don't have any of course gps there so uh, this is there are different people in our group have different versions of the map they have they are saying well the rotor rover is it turned right from here or maybe from here whether it is parked here no it is parked here so this is still there i mean but I am showing this here because this is officially released by ISRO. So maybe later on, after a few months, somebody sits down and everybody consolidates. Maybe a different version of this map will arise where actually it, uh, the rover has reached. And the other point, I mean, the rover actually could be seen in OHRC. There was an option, I mean, opportunity in September 22nd, 23rd. At that time, there were some lighting issues. I mean, the uh, lighting conditions were not optimal, so we could not... Somebody has see, told me that they have seen the rover possibility when the uh, uh, rover is there, but it's not very clear image. So ISRO has not released it. I think uh, another two, three days again, there will be this opportunity for OHRC to image. So at that time, it will be clear whether this point is correct or not, at least. And then maybe we'll be able to backtrack and then see. And then in that path, then finally, when at somewhere here, of course, this image was taken, which everybody has seen slightly further away. The people, this is the image which has been taken and again everybody's seen but like what i want to show here is this one 
which is actually non isro version so if you see right now on social media and entire world so many people are in fact menses they are exceeding more than what isro is actually doing the analysis and their even the uh, their inference of the rover track i have seen the same version with the people who are completely disconnected with isro they have no access to any of the isro thing but still on their own uh, based on some released images and based on some idea they have figured out that rover must be going like this or rover must be going like this so this is like the entire army of people which is uh doing this parallel analysis and they came up with this kind of image where it's a color version of the uh, and which is on that because the camera is of course not color but they based on earlier released images they actually uh, colored the lander and see how it would be looking at it so i just wanted to say that i mean this is the level of excitement which other even general public is also having about it and then they are doing so much efforts and then this is the again i wanted to kind of share so this is the image when the first time it backtrack now if you see only this image there is no way to uh, see that there is a, such a big crater sitting over there i mean later on if some real lunar geologists if he is seeing that that then they say yes we know that okay this terrain is looking at different there is a different texture here so this is not the same this is much farther away so there must be a crater here and all but these are all later so when this was decided so a lot of people have actually asked questions that when you end up all the way crater you didn't know earlier what you are doing but i mean if you see if you are doing only from this image there is no way to actually know that so finally all these things what happened was like eventually the whatever we were expecting the moon i mean it, it turned out to be much more rougher than what was expected and that was the main point why it had to take completely opposite path uh, this is another image which again shows lot of small craters lot of small boulders and also everything has to be taken into account while moving but yeah it was a very interesting uh, exercise uh as i said i mean the different scales of rover and orbit orbiter images are the kind of main thing so uh, ideally what could be done if you have let's say intermediate 10 cm level images maybe well this is again in hindsight we can say easily at that point of time people thought that okay 30 cm images might also be useful which of course i mean it, they were useful but there are challenges despite that so now finally coming again i think i have to exceed quite a bit but this is now my last couple of slides apxs operations yes uh, at the most of the stops where we were going uh, we could operate apxs we have total 23 times which are scientifically useful uh, observations some of them which we have taken only for some kind of taking our deployment movies and all though those we don't consider but uh, these are the actual points where and these points are again this is our own bookkeeping i mean i we have seen that okay we have given this command of this angle and this distance and then so uh, we think that okay this is or well, these are the position at which we have the observations important point is we have good number so we just to compare if you see the chinese uh, u2 rover which launched in 2013 14 i think uh, they also had traveled about 120 meter but they had only two observations so compared to that we have this uh, 23 observations whatever we can say statistically going to be significant statement a major observation is that there is not much local diversity within this observation this and then that statement we can make it much more concretely or much more strongly because we have such a large number of observations in a with a relatively dense population in a 40 meters uh, area so uh, finally uh, this is just to show how it instrument performed i'm just showing the calibration spectrum of one of the observation i mean later on so we were anticipating all the issues because of dust and all nothing like that was encountered it was almost everywhere we were seeing the same spectrum from calibration plate both before and after uh just a representative i am just showing one spectrum of one of the observation so this is actually lunar spectrum uh of course i mean uh, we are going with the more detailed analysis of all this fitting and okay, estimating abundances most of them have been completed also but now saying this okay you have this silicon 15% or iron 20% is one aspect but the next thing is ki what does it mean so right now we are all focusing on that uh, interpretation part of it hopefully we will have something interesting on that and then maybe we can have some more chance of discussing geology of moon but that we will keep it later so as i said i mean finally we had a second of september we were expecting actually third because that was one thing but on by second september we were told okay we are winding up and that was because of this final surprise because this was like completely unanticipated uh, for everybody we were hearing this kind of possibility for 3 4 days in fact so we were all sitting right there in control center but still these things are happening so many of the people were not aware and uh, fi finally the decision that we will actually do it was only taken 24 hour before it and because it it involved large number of number of simulations and testing and what will happen kind of uh, scenario 
uh, because if you see one major problem was in the lander image, if you see one of the leg was seen slightly deeper inside the terrain. And then so the main issue was, is there any possibility of uh, rover toppling? So initially we started with actually the full control guidance in loop uh, kind of bigger hopes, but that was discarded immediately because that was no, there was no time for doing all the reprogramming and everything. So the what was possible was the complete open loop system where you are just firing an engine and then just letting it uh, uh, sit settle down. But there also there was some chance of if the leg is kind of stuck, if it develops some rotation, it might topple. So in order to make sure that it doesn't happen, the first there was the one very small 300 millisecond burn was taken up. And then based on that, you see that whether any rotation is getting developed or not. And then since it was not finally the actual burn, uh, Again, there was this another drama because when it is jumping up, the high gain antenna is a very focused, very narrow beam. So it is immediately getting disturbed, which again, kind of little bit overlooked, I would say. And then after the burn happened, there is no image. But then again, we went back to like early 90s where we were changing antenna and seeing whether TV signal is coming or not and all. We did some time maybe from, but it was like 15 minute, half an hour exercise. But it was again, like interesting time to be there at that point of time. Finally, we get it, and then you see that this is the uh, two different images where you see that uh, rover has actually come back by 40, uh, lander has come back by 40, 50 centimeter. So this was a kind of a final pleasant surprise for all of us. And then, but it, it does give a very important information that how actually it will take up for a given engine performance and all. So it, uh, when we are planning a next kind of sample return return mission, this is going to be important contribution. So that's it. I mean, I think. I don't have any, uh, I will stop here. As I said, I mean, all other payloads have worked very well. They have excellent data. All of them are working. So right now I'm not going into any of that uh, discussion. Uh, FEX has of course yeah. have provided very good data. And then as I said, we hope that in some near future we'll be able to give some more exciting results with FEXS. So I'll just stop. Uh, this is, I mean, I just wanted to keep it because all of that, whatever I have done, I mean, of course, this is like a very big team. ISRO, of course, entire ISRO, I mean, I, a lot of people, in fact, I may not be knowing, most likely, I don't know personally, but there is a huge team working on the lander, uh, spacecraft, launch vehicle, everybody. Without them, it's not possible, but more importantly, our own electronics team. And these are the three key members which are working, Shamugam, Arpit, and Bithun. And then, of course, we have other very big team. But, I mean, I just wanted to make some difference in terms of their contribution, because without any of them, neither... Even the Shanmugam has been working with me actually from Chandrayaan one time. And then without him, nothing has been possible. And the, both our people and Mithun are working from Chandrayaan 2 onwards on all our different missions. I mean, not only Chandrayaan, uh, even Aditya or other our new uh, extra things. So these are our integral people. And then, of course, we have uh, taken a help from a uh, lot of other ISRO centers for our own instrument design. I mean, not only uh, from the sub platform providing side, but the design of our instrument and mechanical design or mechanisms, the deployment structures and also thermal controls, etc. So, I mean, without them, nothing will happen. So this is what is my sort of acknowledgement for them. Stop. Thank you. Uh, indeed, <laughs> out of the world experience, even for those of us who are just only seeing the slides, Imagine somebody sitting in the control room and seeing all this. I don't know how you manage to keep your blood pressure low and uh, things like that. It's very, 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 very exciting world. So, um, are there some uh, questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Santosh. That was a wonderful talk. So, I had two questions. One is a broad picture thing and the other one is a science thing. So maybe I'll ask the science one first. Uh, so you mentioned that over the 270 meters. Uh, no, not 200, it's only 40, 40 meters, 50 meters now. Okay. We actually traveled the entire length of the all traces is 100 meter. Mm -hmm. uh, the distance, this is only about 50, 40 meter, 40 meter radius. Okay. So, uh, from the previous lunar maps from uh, from the remote sensing there are some distributions of colors and minerals uh, is this a particularly plain spot or no no so so that's a, that's a very interesting point i mean this is the exactly the point which we are right now discussing see the remote sensing when you go the lowest size you can address is 100 meter hmm. 
So nothing less than 100 meter you can see. So this will fall only in a single pixel. So within that pixel, it is very difficult to say that whether there is a uh, uniformity or not. So uh, and that is also uh, 100 meter is for optical IR spectroscopy, which is giving a mineral information. If you want to see this uh, direct elemental composition with the X-ray, that is a 10 by 10 kilometer pixel. Right. And then gamma ray is an even 100 by 100 kilometer. So that is why the importance of this going actually in the in situ and then making this measurement and then making the statement is going to be important. So right now, yes, of course, I mean, uh, so the main point is that based on this idea and based on the surrounding terrain, whatever small variation you might be seeing, how much what you can say about not only this 40 meter, but surrounding maybe more than 10, 50 kilometer or 100 kilometer maybe because in the context of moon what happens is that this is all this mixture because one the crater forms somewhere close by the lot of material is coming from there to here mm -hmm. then then again another crater forms then that material get redistributed now this is happening over the last billions of years so that is why you need to build up all this full stratigraphy about which crater happened when so that our teams they are good doing and that is what precisely we need to come up with okay, what how what we can say so in my view, this even this statement that within 50 meter we have this uniformity would actually be able to, we should be able to uh, make a comment over a surrounding at least 40, 50 kilometer area. And that would be a quite important for constraining a lot of models of lunar evolution. Right. Uh, so the second question was about uh, the lessons learned from this experience. So this is the first time ISRO launched a rover. And obviously, even for future rovers, unexpected things are going to happen. But if uh, what are your experiences and what was learned by ISRO? Like, okay, for the next rover, these are things which we need to consider. So, I mean, uh, of course, ISRO also internally, because uh, we are participating many of those discussions, but still being uh, physically distant, there are sometimes limitations, there are more discussions within Bangalore. One clear thing is key, uh, we need to have much bigger, better imaging capabilities. Imaging capabilities are not limited because of like cameras, but they are more from a telemetry side, data rates. Because right now, even if you put a very high resolution camera or multiple cameras, the possibility of bringing down the uh, images is very limited because rover to lander communication is a uh, low power communication and the low data rate communication, lander to earth also. So the, what is important is to actually improve the data rates. And then after that, everybody, I mean, like uh, right now we have only one focused camera, which is not going to be useful. You need to have a larger field of view. So one simple thing would have been like just to put a camera uh, camera to get a 360 panorama. That without that it would not be possible to go ahead. So this some I mean in, informally we are all discussing internally. Now what is finally getting settled that then you will arrive at a later future. But generally basic uh, uh, idea is to see I mean even in this case also we didn't expect too many things. But whatever was expected also turned out to be unexpected. So we try to go back like whatever was done for the landing time. Same thing. We'll have to probably do it for rover also. So yeah, I mean, people are on that and then a lot of lessons are getting implemented in the next course. Okay. I, uh, I had a slightly different question, maybe similar. Uh, what is the expected, you know, elemental abundances in the earth versus moon is there your data does it show any relevance i mean oh, what you okay. so in earth not not too much and that goes again from the formation history of exactly moon because uh, earth mostly i mean moon is mostly formed from earth's crust material only because if you know the uh, moon formation story is like this giant impact is the one which is mostly right uh expected accepted now by the community where the very big planet, mass size planet collided with Earth and then whatever material was ejected. So some part of that planet would have been there, but primarily it is a um, Earth crust. So if we see, there is not much difference. In fact, whatever numbers we have, almost similar to what we see on Earth, uh, what we call on Earth site. Uh, so basaltic uh, rocks are like more rich in a uh, higher Z elements like iron and nickel. So here we are finding much less uh, uh, iron. So iron peak, you will see this is very big, but they're actually in terms of their con concentration, they are smaller. And then uh, these close at silicon and calcium, aluminum, they are much higher. So this is called what we call the call plagioclase rich uh, rock. But it's a similar. So like what we call this our uh, earth, what we see this Aras, that's the kind of rock which in this case, and then that is expected also because this is a highland terrain, uh, which is with a bright albedo. So if you see the moon, I don't have any picture here, but whatever the dark patches we see, lunar mare, 
they are all more basalt rich uh, mare uh, region where you see much higher co concentration of iron uh, but here it is more like uh, anorthosite so the composition wise it's almost similar to what we see it on earth but at the same time since there is no atmosphere there are free falls of the meteors constant yes, it seems yes, right yes. so that may create some difference because we have our atmosphere so, stops all them yeah so i mean uh, uh, so th there is some chance so that is where people are expecting for example uh, if some meteoritic samples are there then they should show a drastic change compared to surrounding terrain but that i would say would uh, amount in a quite lucky plot that you end up in that spot where a local region which is kind of because of some slightly a uh, bigger or micro meteorite impact at least in this case we are not seeing anything like that thanks so much uh, wonderful uh, presentation and uh, thank you thanks that was a very very exciting thing just curious i mean you know your last slide you said that it was not designed to wake up uh, what is the status of rtg power source development because even if you don't use it to power you can at least use it to keep warm so uh, yes i mean uh, rtg still will be little bit away i mean it will take some time rhu is actually under very uh, active in fact okay i forgot to mention it uh, rhu has been developed by brc and delivered to isro it is flying right now on chandrayaan 3 the only issue was ki since all this is much later uh, there was no real time to make any changes either in lander or rover so instead of rhu being on lander and rover it is on propulsion module the <laughs> idea that was only to test and qualify the all the processes related handling of rhu and then putting and then whatever they will uh, simulate thermally because see the thermal simulations and, uh, and expect anticipating uh, temperatures uh, in terms of different power conditions and different uh, thermal conditions is very very involved task so the using rhu on propulsion system was the idea was only to give the thermal systems the sufficient input to handle the rhu kind of systems in space and then establish the processes to use the rhu in place so that is already there uh, next lander i suppose it would not be difficult to use the right now this rhu was very small i think if i remember but only 2 or 3 watt rhu is there but once you have made this it can be done in a slightly uh, bigger time and so uh, even let's say a 5 5 watt source here at a rover or lander at a strategic place could have been useful so the only way to survive over night is to have some kind of this kind of heat source i mean and then that is why this development is very important and it is already signed off as i said progressing i mean okay thanks uh again yeah this one more discussion of course we can always have with the speaker at the I mean, time yeah. uh if there are any questions okay i see so now if you want to ask any question uh to santosh So, uh, otherwise, uh, we'd like to close, uh, but not before. Uh, ending or a nice moment. Okay, thank you. Very good. So, we're speaking to Santosh. Thank you. Which is our forty years moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a wonderful sure. lecture. Yeah. Yeah. So please uh, join for some special plan today as a part of ninety years, nine hundred. Yeah, nine.